Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar on the latest trends in hiring and job openings. I'm Rachel Harvey with Business Forward, and I'll be moderating our conversation today. As you may be aware, the latest JOLTS report was released earlier today. Here to discuss the numbers and what they mean for your business is Heidi Shareholz, the Chief Economist at the U.S. Department of Labor. For those of you who are new to our programming, Business Forward is a national business organization that helps business leaders from across America brief Washington on how to create jobs and accelerate the economy. Over the past several years, we've helped tens of thousands of business leaders from across the country brief more than 450 senior administration officials, members of Congress, governors, and mayors. Before we get started, I want to make sure everyone is able to follow the presentation from your computer. In your confirmation email, you should have a link that says Access Social Webinar. Click this link to view the slides. You can also find the slides at businessforward.org. Look for the page promoting this event. If you have any issues, please email us at info at businessfwd.org. Please note that a recording of the webinar and the slides will be sent around later. Also, this call is on the record and there may be media present. Currently, all lines are in listen-only mode. After Dr. Shearholtz's presentation, we will open the lines up to your questions and comments. There are two ways you can ask a question. You can press 1 on your phone, or you can type a question into the blue chat box at the lower right-hand corner of the screen. You can do this at any time during the presentation. All right, let's get started. Please welcome Heidi Shearholtz, Chief Economist at the U.S. Department of Labor. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, all right, so I will look at the JOLTS data, particularly hiring trends. And you can go to the next slide. I'm going to start out this presentation on JOLTS by talking about an entirely different survey. This shows total non-farm employment over time. And this is from the um, survey that is released on the first Friday of every month. This is the headline number that says, we added X jobs in the economy in July, in this example. So this is when, last Friday, we got these numbers out, and that we added 215,000 jobs in the economy on Friday. And I, I, wanted, I wanted to start with this, because I think it's an important backdrop to the Dole's data. Because these are the numbers people have in their heads. We had, you know, right now we're adding sort of between 200, 250 jobs, 200, 250,000 jobs per month on average. What that maps is the enormous amount of churn that's going on underneath these numbers. So that 215,000 jobs added is the next number of jobs we had in July over the total number of jobs we had in June. But that was really comprised. When you see we added 200 to 250,000 jobs, that, was, that is the result of actually seeing something like 5.2 million hires and 4.95 million job separations. So these net numbers map all of this churning going on underneath, and that's what the JOLTS data get at. They actually let us look at, at sort of the thing that these net numbers that we get on the first Friday of every month mask. So moving on, to, I mean, because the JOLTS survey is less common than the, the first Friday numbers, I will. Uh, talk a little bit about this survey very briefly to give you the background. So the survey started in December of 2000, and the only reason I'm giving you that extremely detailed comment is just to note that it's relatively new. So unlike some of the other surveys at BLS where you can look back decades, for the adult data, we just don't have that. Um, so what that means is that we only, if you're, if you're trying to get information on a full business cycle, so that includes a recession and then the ensuing expansion. The only full business cycle that we have is the business cycle from 2000 to 2007. Um, and then we have it up to the present, but we're still in the middle of our current business cycle. So one thing that I wish we had was the job opening data um, prior to 2000. It would be great if we saw how these numbers played out in a really gangbusters economy like the late 90s. Uh, but we just don't have it, and that's fine. But I think it's good to note um, that when when somebody talks about we're seeing a record high or a record low in the JOLTS data, it's not going back decades. It's only it's only since 2000. 
All right. The other thing that is useful to just keep in mind with the Joule bit is that it's a relatively small sample size, and so there's a ton of month-to-month -month volatility. Could you move? Oh wait, move back one slide. And I just want to remind. Look how smooth this is. A this is a big survey that comes out on the first Friday every month. Look how smooth that line is. It's, a, it's just a very big survey. And now go up to. I just. Sorry, go up one more. This is more, this is, I will get, I will start talking about this concept, but this is a, the exact same time period as that smooth plot, but it just is to illustrate just how uh, jumpy these numbers can be. Because it's a smaller sample size, and that's what happens. When you have a smaller sample size, there's more muscle to muscle volatility. So I'm saying this only to say that when you talk about jolt data, you should really be careful um, to not focus too much attention on any month-to-month -month changes. And instead, because you see this volatility sort of masking a longer trend, it's really important when looking at the jolt data to look at a longer trend. So often, I will just focus on, say, what's happened over the last year, which is a good, which, which is a, a one nice way to catch the longer trend. Okay, sorry for that little dive. Uh, oh, I, I should just also say along those lines, there is a proposal in the president's budget to expand the JOLT survey so that we could have a bigger sample size. Uh, but it's just at this point, it's just a Okay, so uh, to quickly run over the JOLT concepts, I always say I think the JOLT data have basically four main concepts, and they are in this little set. So the job openings are all positions that are open or and unfilled on the last business day of the month. So that's a business is asked how many job openings do you have on the last business day of the month, then moving on to actual hires. So job openings are just what's posted, hires are all actual additions to your payroll. How many people did you actually hire? Separation, exactly analogous in the other direction. How um, what are all separations from your payroll? How many people left your payroll? And people rarely talk about separations overall because the underlying components of separations are far more interesting and actually have very diverse trends. And in particular, it's layoffs and quits are the biggies. So layoffs, that's totally straightforward. It's um, all involuntary separations that happened at a job that were initiated by the employer. Um, and then quit, voluntary quits, they're all voluntary se voluntary separations that are initiated by the employee. Um, and the, they're very different trends from the two series that I will show you pictures of. And then other separations is just a very small category that gets sort of widely ignored in discussions about the JOLT data. It includes, for example, death. If somebody dies, um, they go into other separations and also it captures most retirement. So those are the concepts, and now we'll move on to actually looking at going at what we actually see in the data, this is job openings. So the thing, the key thing that you see in job openings is, and I apologize for jumping around, let me also step back. I'm going to show you a bunch of plots that look sort of like this one structurally. I'm sorry, I meant, uh, you can go back to the plot. That I'll show you a bunch of plots that look kind of like this. And just to clarify, in every case, they go from December 2000, that's the start of the JOLT survey, to the, the most recent data, which is June 2015. Um, and the shaded bars in every case indicate the official time period of recession. So you can see the early 2000 recession, and then you can see the great recession, which is the wide bar down the middle. So that's all of these charts that look sort of like. So this is one that took job openings over time. You can see that it plummeted dramatically during the Great Recession, and then has made pretty steady improvement since. So it's you know it's volatile as we talked about. Um, it's just it's jagged. It jumps up and down most of the month, but but it's it's seen pretty much steady progress. It dropped in the latest data, but that drop is not significant. Um, it is at Last month it set a record high, as I said, a record high at a series that only started in 2000. It was the same as the record high that started um, decades earlier, but it is still at a high level. 
Um, and I'm not worried that this is headed downward because we saw this drop. Again, I think that that drop is likely just this month to month volatility and a general upward trend for jobs. Okay, so one of the things you can go to the next one. One of the measures that people look at with job openings is the ratio of job seekers or unemployed workers to job openings. And I like this measure to be super yeah. intuitive. Yeah. It just oh, sort of I get that back in your musical chairs that job seekers are playing how many other people are you competing against for a job? And I think one of the things that, that this um, <coughs> plot highlights or underscores or makes it important to, to touch on is the fact that job openings aren't, people, aren't job applications that are applying for jobs. It's literally the open job. So when you say unemployed people for job openings, you see that 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 shot through the roof during the recession. There was almost seven unemployed people for every job opening. That doesn't mean there were seven applications for every job opening. That means there were literally seven job seekers for every job opening. There may have been, you know, unemployed people apply for hundreds of jobs. There may have been hundreds of, we don't, we don't have a good um, measure of that. There may have been hundreds of job applications for job opening, but this is literally the number of people on average for job opening shot through the roof during the recession, and then it just made steady progress down um, over time. And now we have less than two unemployed people for job <coughs> opening, per job opening. So it's, it's good news The tremendous progress has been made. This is not healed yet. We're not where we want to be. Um, if you look at sort of, sort of some reference points before the recession, before the Great Recession, the low before the Great Recession was 1.4 job seekers per job opening. Um, and then again, we don't have this going farther back. I wish we had the real gangbusters economy of the early, of the late 90s. But um, we, in at the start of this series, it was 1.1 unemployed worker per job opening. So I think we, we don't have to settle for 1.6 unemployed workers for job opening. We can do better than this. There's still a way to go, but it has made enormous improvement. Next slide. I wonder how other countries This next slide gets at all the one one of the great things that Joel Stata does is it looks you can see these um, numbers broken out by sector and it's not you can small sample but you can't get really nice disaggregated sectors. So we can look at these different sectors. And just to explain this plot, that shows the number of job openings for each of these sectors. Um, and then that's the dark blue line and the light blue line. It's the prior 12 month average. So you can see if the June numbers are consistent with sort of the kind of growth that we had been seeing in the prior year. Um, okay, and so what we see here is that in most cases, that's true. There, there wasn't in June some sector that was totally off compared to where it had, it had been in the prior year. There's, there was nothing really weird in the data in June. Um, and the key sectors that have seen a lot of growth are professional business services. Professional business services include a wide range of jobs. They include architects, accountants, um, consultants, lawyers, um, janitors, temporary health workers. So you think of all of the kind of services that businesses and professionals might um, buy to help them get their job done. Those are the kind of jobs that are in professional business. Um, healthcare also saw these had seen a lot of job openings both in June and throughout the recovery. Um, leisure and hospitality has seen a lot of job openings, in particular accommodation of food services. So that is hotels, restaurants, and bars. Um, and then another one that's seen a lot of growth is retail. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so now, oh, my computer just, all right, got it back. It tried to go to, all right, so, the, so that was job opening. That's one of the key, key concepts in the JOLTS data. I'm now moving on to hires. In many ways, hires are where the rubber meets the road for unemployed workers, for people who are searching for a job. Um, 
And this shows, hires shows a very similar trend to job openings. You see it, that it's plummeted in the recession and it's made steady progress in the recovery. In um, June, it increased by a little 117,000 jobs. That was not a significant increase. Again, because of the small sample size, you have to increase a substantial amount to have it be a statistically significant increase. But what we um, do see is that over the year, that this is headed in the right direction, going steadily, steadily up. Um, so again, uh, on another thing that I think is useful to keep in mind with higher, with the higher numbers um, is that it, it's getting close, but it hasn't quite reached its pre-recession peak. So if you look at the period right before the, the thick, dark line of the Great Recession, it's not there yet, um, but it's getting close. But it is also important to note that the um, labor force has gotten bigger over this period. And so you would have likely expected that hires would even exceed the pre-recession peak. Um, and uh, if we were closer to full employment right now with the kind of the size of the labor force that we had, I think the, high, the rate of hiring would now be more on the order of 5.5 to 6 million. So we still have a way to go. We are, we are making steady improvements, um, but we're not there yet. I think you'll see that kind of message throughout these data, which you see in all the, in all the labor market data right now. We are headed strongly in the right direction, and we still have some ground to make. OK, moving on to the next one. This is one of those pieces of the, 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 the broader category of job separation, yeah, the subcategory of layoffs. This is an absolutely opposite trend from the others that we've seen so far. Layoffs, unsurprisingly, spike up during a recession. But another key difference with layoffs compared to, say, hiring or job opening is that look what happened right after the recession. It very, very quickly resolved. Layoffs came very quickly down to pre-recession levels. And then they've been just sort of hovering around the same level um, for more than four years. That spike in 2010, that you know, you, you see it spike up during the recession, and then it came down, and then there's this, this relatively large spike in the middle of 2010. That is um, in early 2010, as happened every 10 years. Uh, the Census Bureau hires an army of temporary census workers to conduct the decennial census. And those layoffs are that they get let go. They're just temporary workers to just conduct the census and they get let go. So that was that little spike in layoffs in 2010. But essentially, since then, for, you know, for more than four years, layoffs have been back at normal levels. And that is typical of what happened with layoffs after a recession. And it makes sense. Um, after the economy stops actually contracting, which is what the gray bars are, that's when the economy is actually contracting, then layoffs resolve very quickly. Employers are no longer um, laying off workers at an elevated rate. So in that sense, a more sort of useful Series to look at to assess the recovery are the hires rates that we just looked at and also the quits rates that I'll turn to in a little bit. Uh, but before I do that, I want to go, yeah, go on to the next slide. I want to say one more thing about layoffs that I think is interesting. Um, wait, yeah, go to the next slide, sorry. So the, this, this, now this is quarterly data, which we summed up quarterly data because it ended up being easier to compare these two series over time. But this tells the same broad story. The orange line is layoffs that you just saw. It's on the front line axis that you just saw on the prior plot. The blue line is initial unemployment insurance claims. So even now, but particularly before the JOLTS data existed, initial unemployment insurance claims was used as a proxy for layoffs. When people want to get an idea of how many people are being laid off, they look at how many people are applying for unemployment insurance. Um, and so it's sort of interesting to plot those two series together. And if you look before the Great Recession, I think it's illustrative, what you see is that layoffs, there are many 
more layoffs than people who apply for initial for unemployment insurance claims. And that just is the way things are pretty typically, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is not everyone who gets laid off is eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, you have to have a particular, a, a certain level of earnings history to, apply, to be eligible for UI if you do get laid off. And then the other factor is um, many people who do get laid off actually don't apply for unemployment insurance benefits even if they are eligible. Um, so, and, and that's particularly true if job opportunities are plentiful. So if they know I'm going to be able to get a job pretty easily, they may be a lot less likely to apply for unemployment insurance benefits even if they are eligible. Um, so, but what we see then is so typically an initial unemployment insurance claims are below the level of layoffs. During the Great Recession, they actually went above the level of layoffs. So that sort of begs the question, how could that even be true? And what is going on there is all of the people who made up the gap prior to, who, are all the people who decided, that, you know, when they initially got laid off, when they said, you know, I'm not going to apply for an employment insurance benefit because I'm going to be able to find a job. And then they realize after a couple of months that they are in the midst of the worst recession this country has seen in 70 years, jobs are not plentiful in any sense, then, then they will go out and apply for unemployment insurance benefits. So there's often this delay once people realize they're having trouble finding a new job. So that the fact that UI claims actually went above layoffs is sort of this backlog of people who had delayed um, applying for claims. But so when you look at unemployment insurance claims, it's made this steady progress downward as people who get, I, I think the, the key that we're seeing there is not only are layoffs going down, which we, we know that's true from the orange line, but then you're also seeing people who are, when jobs are plentiful and they get laid off, they're going to go right out and apply for unemployment insurance benefits because they know they're going to you know, they may be facing an extended period of unemployment, but as the labor market is stronger, they, people are, you know, going to be more likely to say, I think I can find a job or to actually be able to land another job um, before they would apply. So as we're seeing that unemployment insurance claims come steadily down and, you know, been for a couple of years now, the number of the share of people who get laid off, uh, uh, um, that fewer people who get laid off are applying for unemployment church claims again. So this is more to say that that relationship is kind of normalizing at this point um, post this, post the Great Recession. All right, so now moving on, this is the last major concept I will talk about, which is quit. Um, this is one of my favorite series in the Joel Pena which is one of my favorite surveys, um, that quit health and look at, show the number of people who fall into their jobs. It shows a very similar pattern to what we see with higher job opening. It um, dropped dramatically in the Great Recession, and then it has made this steady improvement over the last six years since the Great Recession ended. Um, the, in, July, I'm sorry, in June, the latest data we had, it was pretty much flat. It went up by 18,000. That wasn't a significant increase. Over the year, it's increased by around 300,000 jobs. So we're seeing this headed in the right direction. Um, it, like hires, is still below where it was before. You know, it, it hadn't yet achieved its, its pre-recession peak. And further, um, given the increase in the size of the labor market and the closure to full employment, I think quit should be more like 3.1 to 3.5 million at this point. So we're still, you know, we still have, again, I said this before, we still have ground to make up, but we're headed in the right direction. One of the things that I think um, several viewers of this chart will easily will, will point out is it looks like it's kind of flattened off in the last nine months or so. And that's, that's absolutely true. We haven't seen much growth in quit. That, you know, it's still jagged up there, but, but overall it, it sort of looks like it's kind of hit a plateau. 
and haven't seen much movement in the last nine months. And what I would say to that is that um, I'm not yet concerned about that kind of plateau because if you look at the series, we've seen other similar plateaus like that that are followed by growth. And so at this point, it's hard to say that that's anything other than just the normal volatility of the small survey, but I'm definitely keeping an eye on it. Um, it did go up, you know, picked up in June, but I, I certainly want, we certainly, we don't want it to plateau at this point. You know, we, it, still, it still needs to heal a little bit more. So I want to continue seeing that grow more. But given the fact that we've seen plateaus of this length, the prior points of recovery that were followed by growth and not yet. Um, and with that, I think I will open it up to, um, oh, you know, let me just say, one more thing about the quiz data. I think I actually sort of left off the punchline of the quiz data. The, the um, key thing that quiz data get at conceptually is the confidence people feel in being able to quit the job that they're in to take another one that is a better match for their skills and experience. So when it's a bad labor market, that confidence, with good reason, goes way down. People are getting locked in their jobs. They know, even if it's even if it's not the right match for them, or it's not the income that they should be able to command, or it's not in the right city for them for whatever reason, um, they can get you can get locked in because job, job opportunities can be so weak in a recession. Um, so as so quick plummet during a recession, and then as job opportunities improve, you see people being able to they gain more confidence that they can secure uh, a, a good job for themselves if they quit the job they have, or they are able to quit because they already have that better job for them lined up. And so greater quits are actually a very good thing for the economy. Um, and I think a useful way to think about that is that obviously for individuals, you're happier if you are in a job that is a better match to your skills and experience, has a greater opportunity for advancement, a higher wage, whatever it makes a person um, leave one job and take another one. That makes the individual better off. It also makes the overall economy run better. The overall economy is it, it's more productive. We see greater growth when it is utilizing the productive potential of all of its workers. So if you have people that are very well matched to the job that they're in, that's actually good for the economy more broadly. So having more churn in the labor market, having people be able to quit their jobs, the jobs that they're in to find one that's better for them, is actually sort of a very good overall sign for the um, And with that, now I will actually stop and turn it over to uh, questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been really interesting, and I'm excited to hear from the business leaders we have on the line, get your perspective, see how this is affecting you, see what you're seeing in your uh, local economy, and how this is um, affecting your hiring decisions. Um, if you have a question, you can press 1 to speak live on the call, or you can type your question into the blue chat box at the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, I'm going to start with a question that I have. Um, Dr. Sheerholz, you mentioned that the JOLT survey is your favorite. What makes it your favorite? Clearly, there's a lot of interesting data, but, um, but well, how do you think it, it tells, us, tells us about the economy in a way that's different from a lot of the other surveys that uh, the Department of Labor does? That, you know, I don't know if I should name favorites because, I mean, there's other surveys that I use all the time. That, I think I like it because it's like, it feels like a little scrappy survey. Yeah. And the, the head surveys, and I put up the unemployment rate and the headline jobs numbers, they get so much yeah. attention that I like to draw attention to other types of information that we have about the labor market right. that maybe aren't grabbing massive headlines, but nevertheless are enormously important yeah. to understanding what's going on in the labor market. One of the things that Joel does um, is it gives us, I mean, we don't have a long series. We don't have a very long series yet, but um, as we as we get more information, we get more experience, like uh, a longer series of data with the JOLTS numbers, um, I think it's going to 
end up being quite useful in a forecast. One of the things that um, it does is it, 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 many of the series in Joel's may um, give us a hint at where things are going in the future. When we see that the turn pick up, that's a good sign for future growth. And conversely, when you see it drop, that's a um, concerning sign for future growth. So I think it's, so it's not just that. It's this, like, in my view, sort of um, survey that should be getting more attention than it does probably, but it also, I think, has very useful, it's a very useful signal for where things may be going. Great. Great. And as a reminder, if you have a question, you can press 1, or you can enter your question into the chat box. We're going to go to our first caller now. We're um, Althea Jackson. Your live is open. You can ask your question. Oh, hi. Hi. Did you have a My question? question? I have a question about people between <coughs> the ages of 50 and 60 that have been sort of pushed out of their jobs um, for various reasons, you know, um, made to retire early. And what is the prospect of that age group actually finding work? So this is a very, very good question. Um, and the data in the JOLTS data don't actually let us um, speak to this question in particular, but I have looked at this question using other surveys, and so I have, I think, I think the, um, here's the, the answer on that one, is, is we are, the unemployment rate for women in that age group, the near retirement age, um, are, it, just like all the other unemployment rates for all, all age groups, shot up during the recession, and it has made a ton of improvements since then. So it went through a very bleak period where it was very hard to find a job. It's not yet back that we're not yet back at full employment, so there's still a ways to go. But overall, it's getting the situation is getting brighter every month. So that's a very that's a very good news. One thing that is um, you mentioned just that the other portion about the breakdown by age of unemployed workers is the. It's, it's a, this is a two-part answer. The older you are, so the higher up the um, wage distribution you go, or sorry, the age distribution you are, so the older you are, the less likely you are to be unemployed in the first place. So older workers are less likely to be laid off. They, they are, um, they're often people value the, yeah, I guess that's the key. Older workers are less likely to be laid off. Their unemployment rates are lower. They're sort of, they're, they're doing less moving around from job to job because their lives tend to be more stable and so they, they tend to have lower unemployment rates. So older workers are less likely to be unemployed in the first place. But if older workers do become unemployed, they tend to stay unemployed longer. So the duration of unemployment is higher for older workers. Um, that's actually true in the depth of the Great Recession, mm -hmm. it's yeah, also is. true in the roaring economy of the late 90s. It's always true that older workers have higher durations of unemployment than younger workers. And that makes perfect sense. Younger workers are sort of by definition more broad. They haven't spent a career developing a certain set of skills and experience. When you have a certain, like more specific set of skills and experience, it simply takes more time to find that job as a good match. Um, and that's true in good times and bad times, but it's especially difficult when we're not at full employment. And that I, I, I feel like a broken record. I've said this. Things are definitely getting better, but we're not there yet. So we're not at a place Too where, you know, Too we all sort of have jobs coming out of our ears. Right. And so it is for older workers to become unemployed it is, uh, the data show very clearly, oh, it is sort of a, a longer road ahead to land that new job, but the overall situation, and including the situation for older workers, is steadily improving at this point. So um, if you would have asked me this question six years ago, I would have, I would have had to emphasize that it's a long road 
outside of that a lot more than I do now. Because at this point, um, it is the labor market is, is a lot stronger and there's a lot um, more job opportunities. So it's it's still longer it's still a longer road for older workers than younger workers, but it is a much shorter road now than it and 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 shortening every month um, compared to where it was. Great, thank you for your question. As a reminder, if you have a question, you can press one to ask your question live on the call, or you can fill in the, ch the chat box in the corner of your screen. We're next gonna go to a question that was sent in by Sylvia from Chicago. She says, you mentioned that the other portion of separations includes retirement. Will that component become more important as baby boomers retire? Are you planning to try to tease that out in another way through the JOLT survey? That is an excellent question, and it's so funny. I was um, riding my bike in this morning, and sort of thinking through the what I was going to have a long bike me, and thinking through what I, how I, this was all going to come together. And um, I was thinking that exact same question. We should be able to, in that other separations category, start to see. We, we've now had, I and mean, starting in 2000. Wait, can I do this math on the fly? The baby boomers started to retire, I think, in about 2010. 